Good morning, at least here from California. Uh, I am honored uh, to have this opportunity to introduce everyone uh, to Dr. Paula McLean, uh, whom I met, uh, Dr. McLean, believe it or not, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, which means, of course, that I am getting older. Uh, and after all of these years, I would never think to call Dr. McLean Paula. And so I am eager to uh, introduce you all uh, to Dr. McLean, who, from where I sit, uh, never needs any introduction. And it's quite fitting, uh, before I get into the details, uh, some of the details of her of her CV and her accomplishments. I just wanna note at the top that it is so fitting that Dr. McLean uh, is talking with us about building the pipeline. Uh, I met Dr. McLean 10 years ago, I believe it was, uh, when I was a Ralph Bunch student. So I was what we call a Bunchy. Uh, and I've not met anybody in the profession who has done more work uh, to build a broader pipeline of students of color, especially black and Latinx students. And so if you have a, a colleague of color or if you've interacted with a student who studies race and politics, they're likely only a node or two removed uh, from Dr. McLean. Uh, and I think her legacy uh, with the placement of students who've gone through Bunch uh, speaks for itself. Uh, many of us keep in touch with each other from the program. We have this big family and Dr. McLean is responsible uh, for building uh, this family. And so I'm so privileged and happy to have this opportunity to share with you some details of Dr. McLean's accomplishments uh, before she talks with us about building uh, the pipeline in political science. Uh, so Dr. McLean is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Professor of Public Policy and the Dean of the Graduate School and Vice Provost for Graduate Education. Uh, before uh, she arrived at Duke, she was at the University of Virginia. She came to Duke in the year 2000. Uh, as we all know, Dr. McLean has long served as the director of the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, which has trained now scores. You'll tell us how many, Dr. McLean, I hope, but scores of students who are now faculty members uh, across, the, across the discipline. Uh, Howard's been in the news recently. Uh, Dr. McLean is a very proud three-time graduate of Howard University. I'm sure she's had a very, very proud week. Uh, her primary research interests uh, are in race and minority politics. And those of us who have written anything on linked faith or, or racial group identity know uh, Dr. McLean's seminal review piece that I can't seem to get away from. And of course, she's published widely over her career in all of our best journals uh, and has a textbook on race and politics that's used in classrooms across uh, the country. Dr. McLean uh, finds time to do many things. She's the president of APSA, the American Political Science Association, the past president of the Midwest Political Science Association, the past president of the Southern Political Science Association, and the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Uh, Dr. McLean has won a number of awards. Most recently, she was awarded the Duke University Blue Ribbon Diversity Award uh, back in 2012, so not terribly recently. Uh, she's been awarded for her mentoring uh, at Duke uh, something that many of us still talk about uh, to this day. I can remember these stories of Dr. McLean telling us how to apply to grad school, what grad schools to look at and which ones maybe to steer away from. And that mentoring uh, has shaped a lot of our experiences uh, in the discipline. And in 2014, Dr. McLean was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Again, I can't think of anybody better to talk about building the pipeline, particularly at a moment like this, Dr. McLean, where I think many of us would agree that the kind of work that many of the students you train go off to do is of similar importance. And so without further ado, I'll turn the floor over uh, to Dr. McLean. Thank you so much, Hakeem. Um, I really, that really is touching to me. Thank you so much. Um, and I also like to thank the uh, ISPP for inviting me to give one of the keynote addresses and to talk about diversification of the pipeline. And in April, in an April 27, 2012 presidential column, Douglas J. Um, Meaden and Carol D. Lee laid out the two paths that efforts to increase diversity in science fall into two categories, concern for equity and social justice and increasing the pool of scientists prepared to address current contemporary needs in science and technology. And it's this second category that I want to talk about 
the Ralph Bunch Summer, Summer Institute. Because quoting directly from their piece, um, that attention to cultural membership and cultural practices and central is central to equity goals and national needs, but also equally important for the construction of knowledge and the enterprise of science itself. Now, the definition of science is broad, so that political science falls into that category. And diversifying the pipeline is not easy, and especially in political science. And the reason why it's been maybe so difficult in political science more so than other disciplines is that the origins of our discipline in the United States stem from some racic, racist notions and racist ideas by the founders of American political science. John Burgess, who fought in the Civil War, thought slavery was, was not so bad, um, and it was one of the founders of the Columbia School of um, Public Affairs. And Burgess's notion was that American Indians, Africans, Asians should never be a part of, be active in, or even be considered a part of the political population. These views imbued political science programs in terms of who could be admitted to graduate school, who was legitimate um, um, subject of study. And there were so many for about a hundred years, people trained in our discipline who had these particular, particular views. So before I can talk about the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, I need to give you a little, a little history of how we got to where we are. And so let me kind of go back to 1954. We have all of this history in political science of not wanting to deal with blacks that we were not a part of this, American Indians, Asians, could not participate in politics. And so by the time we get to 1954, there are 22 black Americans with PhDs in political science. Ralph Bunch was the first receiving his PhD in 1934 from Harvard. And in 54 of the 22 were Bunch and two of his students, um, Robert Martin and Vincent Brown. Robert Martin finished his degree at the University of Chicago. Uh, Vincent Brown finished his degree at Harvard, and there were two women among the 22. Merz Tate, who finished her PhD in 1941 at Radcliffe, and Joel Prestige, who finished her degree in 1954 uh, at Iowa. Most of these scholars were faculty at HBCUs, given that majority white political science departments believed the way Burgess believed. And so these individuals taught and populated HBCUs. And so when you look at Howard University at a particular point in time, the collection of minds, Ralph Bunch, Merz Tate, others was just, was just incredible. And so by the 1940s, Bunch was leaving was leaving Howard to go into um, uh, government service. And there's a quote that I like to use about Bunch um, because you know people think about Bunch in terms of his diplomatic um, work, which he was amazing at, and he got the New, um, Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. But before that, he was a scholar. And he wrote about what we now call black politics, but was Negro politics. And there's a quote that I've used a number of times from Bunch from a 1940 conference on the interdisciplinary aspects of Negro studies, which was held at Howard University uh, in 1940. And Bunch said, concerning the statement made by Dr. Locke, this was Elaine Locke, who was also at Howard at the time, I think we ought to devote some attention to actual possibilities for the publication of articles on the Negro using present available media. In some fields, this is relatively easy. Anthropologists deal with the Negro as a respectable topic, and the journals of anthropology take such articles without hesitation. 
in respect to my own field, which concerns the political status of the Negro, except in so far as papers having to do with the colonial problems and the like are involved, there isn't a very cordial reception for, pa for papers dealing with the Negro. This particular view held in the discipline for so long. And in many ways, some of our colleagues may in fact hold these views today in a way. And so in 1954, you had this tremendous group of scholars who were teaching at HBCUs like Howard where Bunch was before and then his students, Vincent Brown and, and, and Robert Martin. And they were at Morehouse, Spelman, Southern, Atlanta University, Norfolk State. St. Saint, Saint, um, Saint Augustine's. Now let's fast forward to 1969. A grant from the Ford Foundation for a conference organized at Southern University, primarily by Joel Lemire Preston on political science curriculum at predominantly black institutions. In preparing to issue invitations to the conference, Prestige compiled a list of 65 Blacks with PhDs in political science. Of those 65, Dr. Prestige was able to identify that 25 were listed as teaching at Black institutions, 24 at predominantly white institutions, six had administrative positions at Black colleges, seven were at foundations or in government service, one was a high school principal, one was retired, and she couldn't identify the affiliation of one. And as she says, or she states in the report on the conference, the problems of Blacks in the discipline are further underscored by their limited participation in the activities of the professional societies in the discipline. Information made available by the American Political Science Association indicates that one black scientist, Ralph Johnson Bunch, has served as president of the association. Three blacks have served on the council. Eight blacks have made a total of 16 appearances on programs at the association's annual meetings. Seven have served on various study commissions and selection committees, and seven have been awarded fellowships and study grants. This relative lack of black participation in the affairs of the association, coupled with the paucity of political science courses and programs in predominantly black institutions, would seem to indicate a need to give serious consideration to the state of political science in these colleges and the status of those blacks now in the profession. And for the purpose of focusing on these two areas of concern, Southern University, the Ford Foundation, and the American Political Science Association conducted a conference on the political science curriculum from April 17 to April 20th of 1969 at Southern University. There were 10 resolutions that came out of this conference. I'm not going to go through them all, but one was that in 1969, the American Political Science Association established the first committee on the status of blacks in the profession. And it only had five members. And one of the recommendations was that this committee needed to be expanded. It needed to more fully represent where black faculty were teaching. And the last, the last recommendation was number 10. And it was a special, special efforts should be made to get more black students into graduate schools in the South. Now, let me explain to you why it said the South specifically. Of those 22 blacks that had PhDs in 1954, all of them went to universities outside the South. Most of them went on what Southern schools were designating as scholarships to keep Blacks from trying to integrate the graduate schools of their state institutions, Southern states were giving these scholarships to Blacks who wanted to go to graduate school. So of the 54, 
three had finished at Iowa, two at Ohio State, one at Harvard. So there was a reason why they specified the South. And in 1969, this was a time when the private institutions in the South were beginning to um, um, desegregate as well as the public institutions in the South. The year 1969 was also the year that the National Conference of Black Political Science was found, scientists was founded after a blow up at the 1968 American Political Science Association meeting. And Blacks basically withdrew from the APSA for a while, formed the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. And now you see kind of a duality, Blacks participate in both of these, of these associations. So let's fast forward again to 1977. In 1977, the APSA identified that there were 202 Black Americans that had PhDs in political science. And this directory was taken from 1968 to 1977. And at that point, the leading producer of Blacks with PhDs in political science was Claremont, which produced 15, Berkeley with nine, Chicago with nine, Illinois with seven, Arizona uh, Ohio State with seven, and Howard with six. Howard University produced its first PhD in 1967 because it got the PhD program in 63, I believe. That first graduate was Haynes Walton Jr. Haynes went on to have a distinguished career from Savannah State in Georgia and then ended his career at the University of uh, of Michigan. Between 1978 and 1980, Howard University and Atlanta University, two HBCUs, were the leading producers of Black PhDs in political science. Howard with 10 and Atlanta with eight. There was an article in 1985 written by Maurice Woodard and Michael Preston called Black Political Scientist, Where Are the New PhDs? They found that Howard, as I just said, was now the top producer of Blacks with PhDs in political science. And that many of the majority white schools that used to admit and produce Blacks and recruit Blacks had stopped doing it. In fact, this was a period where many of these programs recruited international Black students or international um, Spanish students and marked them down as Black and Hispanic and basically kind of pulled away from recruiting domestic, domestic students. And Woodward and Preston stated that the future looked bleak for Blacks in political science and that the number of Black Americans in graduate programs were fewer in 1983 than it had been in the earlier periods. Now, kind of move forward just a little bit more. Most of the scholars that were at the 1969 conference at Southern University were still active in the 1980s. And the decline in the number of black Americans in political science programs got people to recall the last recommendation from the report of the 1969 conference special efforts should be made to get more black students into graduate school in the South. And after a great deal of effort and with money from the Ford Foundation, the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute was created and its first class came in in 1986 through a partnership between APSA, the Committee on the Status of Blacks in the Profession, and faculty members Joel Prestige at Southern University and Peter Zwick at Louisiana State. The original program, a summer program for African Americans, was aimed to increase the diversity by um, within the discipline by introducing students to the graduate experience and to senior scholars in the discipline. In 1999, the RBSI admitted its first. Latina. And the program was opened up to underrepresented students fully in 2000. But in 1999, a Latina by the name of Carmen Huerta applied 
to the program. And Matt Holden was president and the Committee on the Status of Blacks and said, why not? Latinos are underrepresented in the discipline as well. So coming kind of full, kind of forward to the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute today is that our purpose is similar to the original purpose. That what we do is we enhance writing, research, and analytical skills on the part of RBSI um, applicants. We develop statistical skills because they have to do a database paper in the five weeks. We explore them to participants um, who, who are addressing pertinent questions in the discipline. We introduce them to leading political scientists in the discipline. And we educate them on career opportunities that are possible with a PhD in political science. Now, clearly, our aim is to continue to increase the pipeline, to expand the pipeline for faculty in political science departments. But you know, there's so many different things that scholars can do with a PhD in political science that we try and expose students to, okay, so you don't wanna be a tenure stream faculty person. There are other things at the university you could do if this is what you want to do. There are think tanks, there's foundations, there's a census bureau. There's lots of places where you can take your PhD and use it. And so those of us that um, uh, are staffing the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, um, which is an intensive five week program. Uh, we refer to it as political science boot camp. And the number of participants over the years has varied depending on funding from 12 to 15 to 20 students. We had to cancel in the summer of 2020 um, because of COVID. In this past summer of 2021, we had a virtual, a virtual RBSI. And that was that was challenging. It was probably it was probably more stressful on the part of the students than if they were together at Duke. Um, but I have to credit Duke Learning Innovations for helping us mount this program totally virtually. And so what happens in the RBSI is that the participants take two graduate level classes. We pay tuition to Duke, the students are Duke students. They then get to transfer the credit for these two courses back to their undergraduate institution. For many, they finish their, their political science major with these, with these two courses. I teach the race and American politics class and my colleague, David Siegel, who I'm so grateful for giving up five weeks of his summer, teaches the introduction to empirical methods class. Um, as I mentioned, the students prepare an empirically based paper to satisfy the requirements for both classes. Now, what we tell them is we are not saying that quantitative methods is the be all and the end all of political science research that qualitative research, field experiments, all of these things are just as important. But as you're thinking about going into graduate school, quantitative methods is something that all students have to go through. And if we can demystify a lot of that during the five weeks of the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, students find themselves in a much better place to be able to get through that first year in graduate school. Now the students can choose a topic, the fact that I teach the race in American politics class, that's my specialty, doesn't mean they have to write a paper on that. They can write a paper on anything that's of interest to them as long as we can identify a data set for them to use. We work with Princeton Review um, for them to provide the students with a prep class. It's not the full, I think we have 21 hours for taking the GRE. And our view basically, and why we work with Princeton Review is Princeton Review teaches them how to take the test and it reduces what Claude Steele refers to as stereotype threat. And we try and demystify that through the five weeks of the program. 
that this teaches you how to take the test to eliminate the two answers that are not correct, to figure out the answer that is correct, because despite all of the debate about the GRE, many programs still use it. And what we tell them is that if they're getting 500 applications, they're going to unfortunately use things that are cut scores. ETS says you're not supposed to use graduate GRE uh, scores like that, but many programs do. So they want to make sure their score is within a range that will keep them in the application pool. And I have to tell you that RBSI students are looked at very, very favorably by programs because they know that they've been through five weeks of intensive study. We have a recruitment fair where between 25 and 30 political science programs when we're in person, come to Durham for a whole day of talking to the RBSI students. We had it virtually this year and we still had 22 programs that, that um, um, participated. We have my colleagues in political science at Duke have lunches with the students and talk to them about the four major fields in political science, American politics, IR, comparative and theory, and what the issues are, the current, um, um, questions that are being being explored. My colleagues in the graduate school have a session with the students about applying for to graduate school, what programs look at, how to craft your statement. Um, and one of the things we were not able to do it this year because we were virtual, but in the past what has happened and will happen again next summer is my colleagues in the graduate school blind several applications. And the students look at these applications, read the recommendation letters, look at the GRE scores, and then they decide which students were admitted and which students weren't. Most times they're wrong, right? Because we in the graduate school have tried to move our 55, 56 PhD programs towards holistic file review. And so the students get a sense for how their files should look and what kinds of things they should emphasize and what kinds of things um, they shouldn't. We have talks by prominent political scientists and talks by emerging scholars in political science. We have a session with a bunch of alums after the recruitment fair. We talk about, and I'm just repeating myself here, different pathways for the use of the PhD. And it's a marathon effort for the five weeks. And the staffing, it's an expensive program. And we're grateful for National Science Foundation support, support from Duke University, which, which, which contributes a sizable um, cash contribution to the program and the American Political Science Association. And so the staffing is two faculty, six teaching assistants, a writing tutor, a graduate assistant, Sometimes we have to have more than one graduate assistant because they deal with issues related to the dorm. And Ms. Doris Cross, who has assisted me with the program at Duke since I moved the program from the University of Virginia uh, in 2002 to Duke. Now, let's kind of look at the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute in, in numbers. Now, some of these are not current um, because we haven't been able to find uh, to find those. And the 2020, we canceled in 2020, so the 2021 students are not here. The first phase of the program, which was 1986 to 1995, and this is when Jewel was the, was the moving force behind the program. Ford Foundation funding reached its maximum. There was some funding from the U.S. Department of Education. A couple years, there was no funding. And so it was limited. But even in that kind of constrained resource environment, there were 16 PhDs in political science that were produced from the students from 1986 to 1995. 1995 is when the program moved to the University of Virginia and UVA supported it for like the first year and then we were successful in getting NSF grants. And so the second phase of the program is 1996 to present. And my colleague, um, Stephen Finkel at the University of Virginia directed the program for a couple of years uh, and then uh, left. And then I took over directing the program and I have been doing it since then. So since 1996, we've had a total of 413 students participate. 
so far, and we don't have data yet on 2020 or 2021 because students that we thought were gonna finish have been delayed. Um, there are 72 PhDs in political science, 14 PhDs in cognate fields. And this is one of the, the unintended benefits from the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute is that students come to this and they say, you know, I want to go to graduate school, but I don't think that political science is where I want to go. And so we've had students that have gone to educational psychology, ethnic studies, uh, sociology. And so there's this benefit that we're not only benefiting political science, but we're also helping diversify the pipeline in some of our cognate fields. We've had approximately 90 students who've gotten master's degrees in political science, public policy, and cognate fields. And I think that number is actually, is actually higher because many of these students went to public policy programs um, and others were masters. They started in PhD programs, decided this is not what I wanna do. I want to do something else, but we are pleased that we have this nice, solid group of master's students in political science and public policy. Uh, one of our, um, in terms of, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of our alums, but one alum that I like to talk about um, who got a master's of public policy from Harvard uh, is Sam Sanders. He's an, N he's an NPR um, reporter. He has a program. He decided that what he wanted to do was kind of policy and that's what his NPR program talks about is public policy. There were about 45 to 50 students who came into the RBSI program. We weren't able to convince them that they shouldn't go to, to, to law school, but they made the decision to go to law school in the presence of information about different career paths they could take. And we have approximately now, and I think the number is a little low because I was having difficulty kind of counting as to who may have actually started during the pandemic. About 30 students currently in, in PhD programs. So let me tell you a little bit about what our students are doing. One of the questions that I raised, and I'm not sure I actually said it, but it was in my notes, that a diversity of scholars in political science with diverse backgrounds have posed and answered questions and contributed to a larger body of knowledge in political science that would not have happened without their presence in the discipline. They not only ask different questions, but they have asked settled questions supposedly differently and come up with different results. First person is Nadia Brown. Nadia is a Howard undergraduate and a Rutgers PhD. She has furthered our understanding of descriptive representation by incorporating an intersectional framework into her research. In fact, as with many of the Bunch scholars, their thoughts and their Bunch paper kind of form the foundation of where they wanted to go in their career. And Nadia was interested in women and women, women of color. And so in one of her pieces, examining intersectionality and in symbolic representation, which was co-authored with Sarah Allen Gerson, Brown investigates how identity informs symbolic representation within the context of electoral politics. Her book is on women of color, black women who are elected to state legislatures. In this paper, she and her co-author implore scholars to be more attuned to the qualitative experiences of race and gender in shaping how voters perceive the work being done by their representatives. To that end, her full length book, Sisters in the State House, Black Women in Legislative Making provides a detailed analysis of how identities based on race and gender affect how women, Black women legislate. And one of the nice things about the study is that she also looks at, and maybe not particularly in this book, but in terms of, of Black women's ability to get elected, the politics of hair, how Black women wear their hair, whether wearing a natural disadvantages you with 
the voters. And so it's, it's, it's the kind of questions that majority scholars would not have thought about asking. Next is Camille Burge. Camille is a Bethune Cookman University graduate, another HBCU, and she's a Vanderbilt PhD. Burge expands our understanding of racial group consciousness to show how black political behavior also has a strong affective component in her forthcoming book, Fired Up, Ready to Go, Pride, Shame, and Anger in Black po Politics. Burge shows how emotions tied to one's racial group identity shape public opinion and political decision-making. In so doing, she leverages the tools of political psychology to show that while politics do have a functional component Individuals are also compelled to act based upon how they feel about political affairs. David Cortez. David Cortez's undergraduate institution was the University of Texas, then Pan American, now the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, a historically, uh, a Hispanic serving institution. His PhD is from Cornell. What David has done in his work is he's lo looked at why Latinx individuals work for agencies that have systematically targeted ethnic communities. And he looks at immigration and customs enforcement. And he has interviewed or he interviews a number of these Latino ICE ICE agents. It is the most largest and most diverse study yet of U.S. immigration agents. And he found that Latinx, regardless of their preferred national ethnic identity, their identification with the immigrant experience, or their attitude towards immigrants, choose to work in immigration for their own economic reasons. That things along the border, the economic conditions along the border based on, on US public policy has been such that these Latinos who go into service for ICE are driven more by economics than by attitudes or negative attitudes or not being connected to the immigrant experience. In fact, his work and his results are contrary so what some of the prevailing research out there has, has suggested is that his research stands in contrast to some of the existing literature that asserts that Latinos who accept immigration jobs are far removed from the immigrant experience. So they are not first generation US citizens and they might not have roots in their home country of the ancestors. He finds just the opposite. They do have a connection, but what drives them is economic conditions. Andra Gillespie. Andra Gillespie is a UVA undergraduate, Yale PhD. Um, and her work has operated in what she has called um, how black politics has functioned in what she's called this, in quotes, post-racial America. This notion of post-racial America was a central motivating question for Gillespie. Um, particularly in her two book projects, The New Black Politician, Cory Booker, Newark and the Post-Racial America, and Race and the Obama Administration, Substance, Symbols, and Hope. In each book, Gillespie offers an account of the evolution of Black politics while imploring readers and students of Black politics to revise their understanding of the connection between racial solidarity, vote choice, and policy preferences in the post-civil rights era. Ooh. Hakeem. Hakeem Jefferson is a University of South Carolina undergraduate, a University of Michigan PhD. Hakeem's contributed to the discipline's collective understanding of white racial attitudes. In a particular piece called Seeing Blue in black and white, race and perceptions of officer-involved shootings. 
He considers how perceptions of such events are often conditioned by race. And I think we have seen that in the recent events that have occurred in the United States. And according to Akeem and his co-authors, race influences how respondents believe justice should be served within the context of racially charged events. Cheryl Laird, University of Maryland undergraduate, Ohio State PhD. In her book, Steadfast Democrats, How Social Forces Shape Political Behavior, which she's co-authored with Ishmael White, Laird argues that black partisanship is largely maintained through black societal networks, other blacks policing other blacks politics and their political norms, rather than the notion of racial group consciousness that may push blacks in a particular way towards a party. It's a very innovative argument um, that, that black communities kind of self-regulate partisan identification. And in making this argument, Laird grounds black political behavior in political and social history to show the importance of institutions within electoral politics. This is a challenge to the prevailing literature on the effects of racial group consciousness on political participation. Gabe Sanchez. Gabe is a St. Mary's University um, undergraduate in San Antonio, Texas. It is another Hispanic serving institution. His PhD is from the University of Arizona. Gabe's bunch paper was on Latino group consciousness. And what he found was that measures of Latino group consciousness were really absent in the data sets in political science that we had. And so this identification of the absence of these measures put Gabe on the path to really looking at racial group consciousness among Latinos. Gabe is one of the discipline's foremost scholars in this area. And in a piece taking a closer look at group identity, the link between theory and measurement of group consciousness, Gabe assesses whether the concept of racial group consciousness and more particularly linked fate can extend both theoretically and empirically to Latinos as well as other racial groups. Gabe is in, in that particular paper, Gabe shows that though racial group consciousness measures often predict black political behavior, the results for Latinos and other racial groups are less clear. Such research has played a vital role in furthering our understanding of Latinos' political attitudes and behaviors. And as I said, the beginning of this work was his RBSI paper in in 2000. Candace Watts Smith, Duke undergraduate, Duke PhD, went off. She's now coming back to Duke as a tenured associate professor. We were able to recruit her back from Penn State. Um, her book, Racial Stasis, The Millennial Generation and the Stigmatization of Stigma Stagnation of Racial Attitudes in American Politics, co-authored with one of her grad school colleagues, Chris DeSantis, turns on its head the conventional wisdom that generational replacement will mean a more racially progressive nation. Instead, what Smith and DeSantis find that is that although millennials' language and rationale around race racism and racial inequalities are different from previous, general, uh, previous generations, the end result is the same. The book is a clarion call for the need to update our measures of racial attitudes in light of changing political conditions while also being attuned to how those changes shape how people articulate their racial expressions. Candace's first book, and I just want to kind of talk a little bit about that, is called The Black Mosaic. This stemmed from her Mellon Mays paper when she was an undergraduate, where she wanted to look at the politics and relations between native-born Blacks 
and black immigrants. And in that field, she has she has extended the work of Mary Waters, a sociologist, and looked at the kind of emerging and developing and tensions between native born slave descendant blacks and black immigrants. Julian Womble. Julian is a Drew University undergraduate and a University of Maryland PhD. One of the former bunch teaching assistants teaches at Drew University. And he has sent us a number of students and Julian was one of them. His forthcoming book, We Choose You, Investigating Black Voter Candidate Preference and Selection. He builds upon his award-winning dissertation research to answer the question, what considerations beyond skin color and partisanship do black voters use to choose candidates to support? In, all, in answering this question, he offers a theory named the Community Commitment Signaling, single, signaling Framework to explain that black voters look for in a that black voters look for in a candidate a commitment to prioritizing the racial group's political interest. This is true for any candidate, irrespective of race. And this work illustrates the deceit, the strategic decision making of black political actors and helps to elucidate how voters distinguish between candidates who might, given their physical attributes, seem similar. Veshla Weaver. Veshla is a UVA undergrad, a Harvard PhD in government and social policy. Her path breaking work on policing and the carceral state has helped individuals within and outside the discipline understand how state policies and institutions shape racial inequality in the United States, particularly within the context of the security state. Her book, Arresting Citizenship, The Democratic Consequences of American Crime Control, co-authored with Amy Lerman, argues that the growth of criminal justice has fundamentally recast the citizen-state relationship. In so doing, she and Lerman highlight the centrality of race within the American democratic experiment. And the last student I wanna highlight is Chris Cepeda Millian. He is a Loyola Marymount University undergrad and a Cornell PhD. In his book, Last Latino Mass Mobilization, Immigration, Racialization and Activism, Cepeda Millan explains how policy threats heighten racial group consciousness among Latinos, creating the conditions for Latin mass mobilization using the immigrants' right, rights movement that arose in the spring of 2016 as a case study, Zapata Milan pushes us to consider the role that immigration policy has in activating political activism among Latinos. Absent the critical work of each of these scholars, our collective knowledge as a discipline would be far less robust than it currently is. Bringing to bear diverse perspectives, approaches to their research, and an openness to challenging existing assumptions and theories about American politics, these former RBSI scholars have certainly made their mark both within and outside political science. Moreover, as Hakeem mentioned, the network of RBSI alums is strong, and now are many, now many of them who are in faculty positions are sending their students to the RBSI. The need for programs like the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute is still great and is based on the history that I recounted at the beginning of the talk. We cannot assume that graduate programs in political science will actively recruit and train underrepresented scholars on their own. 
the RBSI continues to be an important factor in this continuing and ongoing process. And let me just end on a statistic that highlights why something like the RBSI is still important. In that 1985 article by Maurice Woodard and Michael Preston, where they were concerned about black political scientists coming behind them, they found that in 1984, there were 34 black Americans that received a PhD in political science. According to the National Science Foundation survey of own do earned doctorates in 2019, the number was 23 black Americans that received a PhD in political science. There were 42 Latino scholars, but there is still much work for us to do. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you listening to what turned out to be longer than what I had anticipated. Thank you, Dr. McLean. I think uh, we all benefited from being reminded of what an important bit of our discipline the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute is. And I was in those 2019 numbers, Dr. McLean, uh, of Black folks who got their PhD. And so uh, while we're waiting for perhaps a question to come into the chat, Dr. McLean, I thought I would just pose a question to you, having now sat through on the faculty side, some faculty meetings where folks are talking about the difficulty of recruiting students. And what we often hear is that it's a pipeline problem, right? It's a pipeline problem and that's structural and hard for us to deal with, but you know, we can't do much because it's a pipeline problem. What would you say to those departments that uh, are, are seemingly interested in recruiting students of color, uh, but are having a challenging time doing so? Besides sending undergrads to Ralph Bunch, what would you say to these departments? First of all, I'd ask them to look at their graduate program, right? Are they contributing to producing PhD students, underrepresented scholars to fill these faculty lines? And putting on my Dean of the Graduate School hat, there's so much that goes into um, why students get admitted to graduate school. There's so many vagaries in this process that if you're not deliberate about looking at files in a holistic manner, you're gonna continue to admit the same types of students that you admitted before. There is a move for, you know, to remove the GRE, but let's be serious. No GRE does not equal equity, right? Because people are going to begin to look at other things. And let me just give you an example. So you have no G GRE score, okay? And you default to GPA. Well, there's a lot of research out there that indicates that grade inflation, and my institution, Duke, is among the top 20, is higher at private institutions, then at public, and then more than HBCUs. So if all you're looking for, you're gonna drop the GRE and you're gonna go for GPA, you're introducing another thing of bias. So people have gotta get serious about this. They've gotta get into the game of training scholars. And let me tell you, there's a lot of talent at HBCUs. If you look at the students that I talked about, Many of them had their undergraduate training at HBCUs, and there's all of these myths that faculty at HBCUs don't do research, that the programs are not rigorous. That is the absolute opposite of what you find at HBCUs. Most of these people that say that have never talked to someone at an HBU, never been to an HBU, but their own biases and so one of the things that we've done at Duke, because we're part of the, the Sloan, we've got a university center for, for um, exemplary mentoring, is that our nine STEM departments, we brought Cynthia Neal Spence, Spence uh, who's part of the United Negro College Fund uh, and uh, a professor at Spelman to talk to the faculty in these nine STEM programs about the myths about HBCUs. And you know, after she did several workshops, when you look at our Sloan Scholars, we've got a Talladega, we've got a Tuskegee, we've got a Howard, we've got a Spelman. People begin to recognize that there's a lot of talent out there that they and their own biases think, oh, they can't possibly compete. And that is so far from the truth. 
that's the Dr. McLean that I know and love, a Dr. McLean <laughs> who tells it like it is. Uh, and, and I think this is right, Dr. McLean. Departments that consistently aren't recruiting students of color uh, can't, I think, your answer would be say that, oh, it's somebody else's pipeline problem. It's a, it's a problem with one's own department. If you don't have students of color year after year, it's perhaps because you're not working hard enough uh, to get them. Uh, so we are now out of time, but I want us to thank Dr. McLean again uh, for the remarks that you made about the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute. Uh, and perhaps Dr. McLean, one thing before we go, if people want to support uh, your efforts with the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, besides sending students to be a part of it who are undergraduate students, what might folks do who want to learn more about Ralph Bunch or want to find ways to help out the program? The American Political Science Association has an endowment for the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute. So, you know, you can contribute to that. But I also would implore you, for those of you who are faculty, to think about how you as faculty look at graduate applications and what you need to stop thinking about in terms of biases and begin to expand the mind. I mean, the fact that we, I'm an HBCU grad, a very, very proud one, fourth generation Howardite, that there is just so much talent, so much out there that you just cannot just w write those people off. So I'm always willing to talk to folks. I, you know, I've about the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute. I talked to a foundation a couple of weeks ago about, you know, trying to do something in their area um, for Japan studies. So just. <sighs> I guess send money, no, <laughs> but open your, open your mind to what exactly is going on in your own departments and how you can be an agent for change and not just one that complains that change is not happening. Dr. McLean, I'm going to give you the last word there and thank you so much for these inspiring remarks and for the great work that you continue to do to make our discipline better. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. I had a good time. Thank you. See you, Dr. McLean. Be well.